Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Ryan, and I am the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight to an Ask With Forum entitled edX, Reinventing Education. It is my pleasure to introduce Anant Agarwal, a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and president of edX. edX, as many of you already know, is a nonprofit organization created by an historic partnership between MIT and Harvard to create an open source platform for online courses. The goals of edX are to increase access to education, enhance the on-campus experience here and elsewhere, and to generate research about online education and teaching and learning more generally. edX, as you may also know, has generated some controversies and some questions, which we may get into um, during the discussion. For now, I'd like to talk briefly about the first part of edX's mission, that is access to education. Anant has a rather modest goal for edX. He wants to use it to educate a billion people around the world. Some of you may take this as hyperbole, but some might have said the same thing about edX's goal of reaching a million users, a milestone that the organization hit just this past summer, a little over a year after its founding. Under Anant's leadership, edX has witnessed tremendous growth and shows every sign of continuing. And I'd like to take this opportunity to share what I see as the five secrets behind Anant's um, success so far. First, Anant is a true entrepreneur. This is not his first startup, uh, and indeed he started very young. At age 12, as a child growing up in Mangalore, India, his first business venture was to build coops for 40 chickens and to sell their eggs. I heard, uh, I've been told that this was uh, a great success. <laughs> Second, Anant is resilient. He was so, in his first year of college, he felt woefully unprepared, so much so that he failed his first physics midterm. He was so devastated by this setback that he redoubled his efforts and went on to earn a bachelor's degree from the Indian Institute of Technology at Madras a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University, and more awards than you or I could count. Third, Anant is driven to be the best. Proof of this, along with two colleagues at MIT, Anant holds a Guinness World Record for the largest microphone array in the world. If you have no idea what a microphone array is, I, I, I would suggest you Google it when you get home tonight. Now, the only reason I can think is that to be driven to build the largest microphone array in the world is that you're the type of person who is simply not content to have built the second largest microphone array in the world. Fourth, Anant is a great teacher. The review for his course, Circuits and Electronics, the first offered on the edX platform, were overwhelmingly positive. Students described the course as brilliant, challenging, exhilarating, and rewarding. One student even remarked, I took what I learned from this class and built an electronic cat feeder, <laughs> proving that the course was not only inspirational but also highly practical. Fifth, <clears throat> and perhaps most importantly, Anant believes that education is a basic human right. He has said, I believe education should be available to everyone like the air we breathe. Hearing him say this was my aha moment, to borrow one of Anant's favorite phrases. Some people look at a number like a billion and see exaggeration. I see it as a kind of aspiration we need to achieve universal access to education, to ensure that every child and young adult around the world has the knowledge and skills necessary to lead a successful and fulfilling life. I'm encouraged that someone with Anant's vision is leading such an important venture. Through edX, students from around the world, so long as they're equipped with an internet connection and the will to learn, have access to high quality education from 29 colleges and universities, including MIT, Harvard, and UC Berkeley. Right now, there are more than a million users participating in courses on topics ranging from poetry in early New England to computational neuroscience. But I recognize that it might be difficult to understand in the abstract the power of edX and indeed the power of online learning to fundamentally change the way education is available and offered and delivered. So let me give you one last example that brings the idea home, I think. 
A 15-year-old girl in New Delhi signed up for Anant's course, Circuits and Electronics. She had no formal background in the field. She had taught herself to solder at age 12 and spent some of her spare time repairing vacuum cleaners and tinkering with amplifiers. Because the course required a basic understanding of calculus and physics, she taught herself these core concepts using videos from Khan Academy. She put in about 20 hours of work each week and completed the course in 14 weeks. When she finished, she sent an email to Anant telling him how much she loved the course. He forwarded her email to MIT admissions and the head of the Office of Engineering telling them that this was the type of student they needed at MIT. These are the kind of minds that edX has the power to reach. We are so fortunate to have the president of edX with us here tonight, Professor Anant Agarwal. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I need to hire him as my, uh, as edX is head of marketing. <laughs> so uh, th th thank you. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the kind words. But it's just an extraordinary team at edX down the road. A few hundred yards, come on down and visit at the intersection of Broadway and, uh, and uh, Galileo. Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, I just reached the high point of my life. I, uh, so the professor at MIT and then uh, I know was running edX, but uh, this was big. I got this yesterday. <laughs> so how would I do? So uh, <laughs> I, have, uh, I have now arrived. <laughs> Raise it up. Oh, the mic is not on? These MIT guys, they can't deal with technology. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I, as I said, I arrived yesterday. I got that ID. So uh, uh, it's great. It's fantastic to be at uh, the, uh, the School of Education here. Uh, it's particularly exciting because uh, education is really, really hot right now. And uh, we're all really excited. I've been an educator for 26 years. I joined MIT in 88. And uh, education was sort of something we did. You know, we talked about research. We talked about big microphone arrays. And, uh, and we really also built chips. And those were the tiniest chips. So, uh, so we covered both you know, the entire gamut. Uh, but we didn't talk a lot about education. The conversation has completely changed. And uh, things have become really interesting. Uh, let me ask you the following question. Um, how many of you did email uh, 30 years ago? Who, who, who did? You? Many of you are uh, much younger than that, of course. So clearly you didn't. So very few. Uh, it was using Emacs and uh, real crappy uh, editors and uh, Unix. And the whole thing was a mess. But look at email 30 years later. It is incredible. You know, it, it won't let go. It's awesome, I suppose. What about uh, cell phones? How many of you used, uh, used a cell phone in the late, uh, or a mobile phone, I should say, in the late 80s? We used to have this big pedestal on the ground in the car. And there's a big boxy thing that uh, you, know, uh, you would hold to your ear. And you actually had to use both hands to hold it. <laughs> and uh, you know, I actually have driven down the mass spike, I promise you, with, with one of my knees on the steering wheel and trying to hold onto this phone. And I said, this, this doesn't work. And that was the late 80s. And about 25 years later, look, uh, look where we've gotten with the smartphones that can pretty much, do, uh, pretty much do anything, 25 years. But technology has absolutely changed the world, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, uh, communications, whether it's transportation. Everything is completely different. But education hasn't changed. What is shocking is the same thing that we talk about in one breath as a basic human right. And it hasn't changed. Email has changed. I mean, just this maniacal, painful thing that, that follows you around wherever you go. I mean, that's completely changed. But education hasn't. And since I'm speaking at the Graduate School of Education as, a, as an educator, um, the researchers from here, uh, the research you are doing, uh, has just been spectacular. And, my f and, and shame on me, the first education paper I read was uh, about uh, 12, 13 months ago. I'd been teaching for 26 years, 
But the first paper, as an educator, the first paper on education that I read was 12 to 13 months ago. Shame on me. But because of MOOCs and edX and so on, I've been reading a lot of these papers. And what is amazing is what we're discovering, at least I'm discovering, is that a lot of the things we're doing on edX and online learning and other MOOC providers and so on, there's really not much that's new, not much that you all didn't know. So you know, don't be surprised if you sit there as I talk about stuff and you're saying to yourself, oh, I knew that, I knew that, big deal. Yeah, absolutely. So why didn't I know that before last year? Why has the education system not changed? I don't know. But as the very least, what MOOCs have done. So MOOC is this new four-letter word. I was invented about four years ago. It's four letters, starts with an M, massive open online courses. What, as a minimum, what MOOCs have done is really brought education to the front and center of the public ethos. Everyone's talking about it. Heck, even VCs are putting money into it. When's the last time you heard profit-motivated investors put money into education? You know, previously, as an educator, we had to hold a bowl you know, and say, hey, you know, give us money. Basic human right. But now investors are throwing money at it. It is absolutely unbelievable. And so uh, research has known a lot of the kind of things we're doing today, like active learning, instant feedback, mastery learning. The, the list goes on and on. But we never really applied it. So let's let, let, let take a look at this, uh, this example. So this was a classroom at this little university down the road. It also begins with an M, it's three letters, <laughs> and high technology. So this was a classroom uh, about 30, 40 years ago. And uh, this is a classroom today at this four-letter M Institute, high technology. What's different? What's changed in this classroom? The seats are in color. <laughs> yeah, awesome. But not much has changed. Now, some of you would have said, hey, you know, there's a, there's a uh, oh, uh, you know, PowerPoint, there's a projector. But, uh, uh, you know, in, in, this, uh, hallowed, in these hallowed halls, I don't have to tell you that uh, PowerPoint was probably two or three steps backwards, not uh, forwards from the blackboard. I still use the blackboard when I, uh, uh, when I used to teach a year ago, uh, you know, before we discovered, uh, you know, newer ways of uh, teaching. So uh, things really didn't change. And uh, educators and researchers knew a lot. But you know, we just did not apply it. Email changed, but we did not apply it to, uh, to learning. We haven't done very, very well with access to education either. So quality hasn't changed a whole lot. Access hasn't changed. So this is a, so you know, look at the stuff here. This is not a rock concert. And uh, this is not Madonna, OK? So uh, this actually, believe it or not, is a classroom at the Obafemi Owolowo University in Nigeria. Now. You know, we've all heard of uh, a long-distance education. OK, but, uh, but what about this? To me, this is uh, a long-distance education, particularly for the people way back here. <laughs> so access has been a real challenge with the education, and not just outside, but even in the US. We hear stories of, uh, of uh, veterans coming back from wars and uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the aid and, and, and other financial assistance given to education. They get about $20,000 a year. The whole number of education institutes set up whose basic goal is to churn people in and out. And guess what they charge each year? A lot of the, the previous online ventures and so on, you know, I'm, the, many of them were very reputable, but uh, they charge exactly that, 20000 a year. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. So access is a big challenge, not just in the US, but in other parts of the, uh, of the world as well. I was, at, uh, uh, I was at the World Economic Forum in, uh, in China, at Dalian, uh, a few weeks ago. And I, I met a minister from, uh, from uh, DNC, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they mentioned that only 25% of their of the school children have access to a bricks and mortar school. Do you know what percentage of access to a cell phone? How access to bandwidth and cell phones? 80%. <laughs> we talk about flipped classrooms. Well, what do you call this? It's flipped something. Flipped pri uh, priorities, maybe. But we can use those technological advantages to our, you know, to our, to our benefit and try to change education by, by doing so. So, so edX was, so we, so we created edX uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, to try to address these challenges of improving the quality of education, both on our campuses and beyond, and increasing access to learning for learners all over the world. So edX is a nonprofit, uh, although we run it like a real startup company. Um, it's, uh, it has a uh, commitment of $60 million from MIT and Harvard. 
We have about uh, 30 of the world's best institutions who are partnered with edX, offering courses on edX. You know, besides uh, Harvard and MIT, there's UC Berkeley, uh, University of Texas System, Georgetown, um, IIT Bombay, Tsinghua, Peking University, Hong Kong University, uh, Seoul National University, EPFL, University of Toronto, really great institutions around the world offering courses on the edX platform. And many of them have also contributed dollars to our effort. So uh, here's our site, edX.org. And one of the things we did was a lot of people felt uh, intimidated. They said, okay, what do I go and do? What does the course look like? You know, um, heck, circuits and electronics, differential equations, that's not for me. So, uh, so what we did was we created a demo course. So the demo course, so you can go to edX.org, and I recommend that you, uh, just by clicking on it, you can uh, take, the, uh, take Demo 101. It's a demo course. And uh, it not only shows you some of the cool things that you can do online, but it also walks you through how to take an online course. Okay, so think about Demo 101 as an online course <laughs> on how to take an online course. We can talk about uh, self-referential uh, uh, media there. So, uh, so we have a number of university partners that put courses on our platform. And so here's an example course. So uh, uh, we were highlighting uh, the Harvard course. Uh, and uh, a spectacular course involves uh, the science of cooking. So the, how do you teach physics by uh, working with some of the greatest chefs in the world? And uh, uh, amazing story, I was in, uh, I was in Boulder, uh, Boulder, Colorado, a few months ago at the Aspen Festival. Uh, some of you may have been uh, to the festival. And I was sitting at a small little dive and having, uh, you know, having a drink and eating some food there. And, uh, and, and, the, sh and the chef comes in and says, how do you like it and stuff like that. And uh, he saw me working on a laptop. And, and I was you know, doing email and you know, eating at the same time late at night. And then uh, uh, you know, it turned out that I was actually, I had the edX portal up. And I was you know, checking out some things. He said, oh, edX. He said, hey, I'm teaching a course. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm, uh, you know, I've been talking with them about being one of the chefs on that course. I said, what a small world, <laughs> but, uh, but, but amazing. So, uh, so some, some really, really spectacular uh, uh, courses on the platform, and, and uh, uh, a large number of them from Harvard and MIT, and other universities are picking up as well as we offer these courses. So what is the mission here? So uh, we have a three-part mission. A big part of our mission is access, as Jim mentioned, which is how do, how do we, uh, as we said, education is a basic human right. You know, how do we help the world? How do we help? everybody in the US or the rest of the world get access to, uh, to something, okay? Uh, a, a, uh, ideally a fantastic education, but at least some education. And so by, by having a purely online experience, uh, we have, uh, today we have uh, one point, uh, uh, it's close to 1.4 million students from every country in the world. As an example, we have about uh, 100,000 students from Africa alone. We have about the uh, second largest contingent from India. And so we have about 200,000 students from uh, India. And so these numbers are big numbers. And, uh, and uh, so Jim uh, threw uh, uh, billions around. So uh, it actually turns out that uh, it may not be that crazy. Uh, for one thing, MIT's open courseware had 100 million uh, students uh, you know, take the, do open courseware stuff over, uh, over the past uh, a dozen years. And uh, you know, in, in the web world, you can imagine doubling enrollment, you're doubling the number of users every year. So I can imagine in the first year, a million. And you double every year, it takes 10 years to get to a billion. We'll see. <laughs> so, uh, so, so access is one part of it. Uh, the second part is to improve the quality of education. And I'll show a lot of examples where, uh, and, and some proof points as to how we can improve the quality of education you know, at the same time as increasing access. The third is uh, research. How do we enable research? How do we help our partners, you know, whether it's uh, in this building here, Folks like Andrew Ho and others, you know, get access to the big data of learning. So we have this big data of learning, and how do we make that available and uh, partner with researchers to understand how people learn? So those are the three big goals: access, quality, and uh, research. And then, of course, we base this on an open source platform. So we make our courses available to people around the world, and we've also made our platform available for free. So uh, uh, on June 1st, we released our entire platform code as open source. And, uh, and uh, you know, almost every week I get an email from somebody saying, hey, we stood up your platform. It's the Birla Institute of Technology in India said, hey, we stood up your platform, you're now offering MOOCs. And they had the edX logo all over the place, and they said, hey, look, we want to give you credit. I said, you know what, you may have to take off the edX logo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the credit. Just have a little powered by edX or so on uh, 
you know, at the bottom. Uh, people are sensitive about uh, logos and trademarks and uh, things like that. But, but these are popping up uh, all over the world. And you can see some of the characteristics of the platform. In fact, over the next uh, uh, several uh, days or hours, uh, the nations will be announcing, uh, you know, adopting the edX platform uh, as a national infrastructure. Uh, you'll see one or two of these happen over the next uh, couple of weeks. And, and I think making the platform available as open source enables others to adopt it and help you improve the platform and uh, just increase the velocity of how fast we can, uh, we can move. So um, I talked about research. So uh, I, was at a, uh, I was giving a talk this morning, and uh, I heard uh, uh, Andrew uh, McAfee talk. Uh, he was talking about uh, big data and so on and so forth. And, uh, and I want to show you a quick result from big data. So uh, th this was an amazing, I love this quote. He said, in God we trust, the rest bring data. So we're talking about, so on edX we have the millions of students. And what you can do in terms of research is that in the past you, had, you did research with small, uh, small group classes and students taking surveys which are inaccurate and subjective. And so you had small data, so you had to have big time. Like you had to do the experiments for a long period of time. What you can do with big data, if you're collecting large amounts of data, is you can do big data and small time. In one fell swoop, in one experiment, you can do a lot of experiments with just very, very large numbers. I just want to give you one sample of the kinds of things that are possible. And this is already in the space of one year. So this was uh, a research project with, uh, uh, with, with this uh, the GSC, the uh, School of Education here, and uh, MIT. This was Andrew Ho and team uh, working with uh, Lori Breslau and others at uh, the Teaching and Learning Labs at MIT. And just, just to show you a quick result of, uh, of uh, the kind of uh, data that you can get and the results that you can get. So uh, you know, I, have a, uh, I have a son who's a sophomore and, uh, in college. And all through school, he would say, you know, what's the point of homeworks? You know, there are no grades. You know, what's the point? I mean, who cares about homeworks? And, uh, and, and uh, there's no data I could show him that homework so, you know, is good for you. you know, we have data showing vegetables are good for you. But, and so I could show him data that says you know, vegetables are good for you. But how do you, how do you convince uh, students and so on that doing homework is good for you? Okay, work at it. And so here's, uh, you know, here's some interesting data. What does the data show? This says that on the x-axis is the amount of hours students spent on homework. And we can get that on the edX platform because students are doing everything online. So we can actually measure the amount of time they are spending and we're gathering this data. We don't have to ask them subjectively, how much time do you think you spent on this? There's a lot of subjective. Here we can actually you know, measure it and we have to make some approximations and so on, but you know, it's within, you know, uh, pretty reasonable. Can measure the, the, the time they spend on homework. And then here, we can measure what they got, uh, what the overall grade in the course. And what is interesting is that uh, uh, the research found that there is a nice positive correlation between the amount of time you spend on homeworks to the overall grade you get in the, get in the course. So uh, it seems to me that before we teach any course, we should just uh, slap this chart and say, hey students, remember the more time you know, here, we have data that shows that students who spent, now, there may not be a causal relationship between that, but the data shows that the students that spend more time on homework tended to get better scores, there was a correlation. And so, so data like this can be, and look at each of these points was one student. And so this was data from, I forget how many students, but uh, tens of thousands of data points. There were 155,000 students taking this course. And so you can get this big data and you can get uh, uh, decent results very quickly without having to go through samples and uh, you know, uh, 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 small samples over a long period of time. So, uh, so what did MOOCs really take off? What was all the excitement about? Well, one of it was just that the large numbers. When we launched edX and uh, and, and uh, this was the first course on edX, the circuits and electronics course. We had 155,000 students take the course from uh, 163 countries. And this was with no, uh, with uh, zero dollars in advertising. And, uh, and, and we had been pretty honest about advertising. We said this course requires differential equations and uh, you know, it requires uh, complex analysis and all of that stuff. And uh, still a large number of people signed up. And you will see, uh, this is a big number. So 155,000 uh, in the first course so is bigger than the total number of alumni of MIT in its 150 year history. That's a big number. It got the alumni office really excited. <laughs> and then uh, uh, here are some other statistics. You know, I can go on and on. There's just so much fun stuff. There's so much data. So we know how many people attempted the first problem set. 
So, uh, you know, researchers like uh, David Pritchard and, and others are defining, you know, how do you define an active learner versus uh, someone who's just curious about the course? So someone who attempted one or two problem sets can be defined as an active learner. So here we measured that, and we can actually measure that. So uh, 26,000. At the end of the day, 7,200 students, uh, roughly, uh, pass the course. So there's grading, they get certificates, uh, and, uh, and uh, Jim talked about some of the students that uh, you know, uh, did, really well, did really well in the course. And so, uh, so just to give you some sense of the kind of stats that we can, uh, we can gather. Now, in addition to these large access issues of these courses, another, another thing that is pretty intriguing, but for which we don't have any data, is that is there a potential for getting more efficiencies in how we teach? And, uh, and certainly some of the bean counters are excited because uh, we, we use the same staff resources that we would use for a 100 person, 150 person on campus class. Now we don't have any data whatsoever at this point to show that we can make on campus education any more efficient. In fact, so far the data is that we can improve the quality, but it's not clear we can make it more efficient. But anyway, that is something that uh, we'll continue to look at over time. Well, the other interesting thing that's happening is that you know, as we, Fundamentally, what do we believe we can improve the quality of learning? And I want to tell you a quick story before I go into the rest of the talk, talking about how we can improve campus education, what are some of the proof points. And for this story, you know, this time I want to talk about my daughter. So she's, uh, you know, when she uh, became a teenager, you know, uh, she stopped speaking English. I began speaking this new strange language, uh, which I call teenlish. It has two sounds, a grunt and a silence. And, and communication was really, really hard. Until one day, I happened to text her, and I got an instant response. I said, wow. I texted her again, got another instant response. And since, and since that time, the communication has been great. You text her, I get back an instant response. <laughs> and my wife insists on calling her now and again. And she said, oh, no, you know, physical contact is important. You know, hearing each other is important. And uh, she, would, she calls my daughter. And my daughter said, why are you bothering me? But you text her, boom, she'll respond instantly. <laughs> So this is the new millennial generation. Okay, I don't understand it. Okay, and, and this is the world of all of these new words that I did not know about until three years ago. Um, how many people here have, uh, have heard of uh, texting? How many people here text? All of you do. Okay. How many people here tweet? A smaller number. How many people blog? Even small. How many people, now let's see, this is the real test. How many people Snapchat? <laughs> oh, not bad, not bad. That's, a, that's, a, that's the latest biggest thing, Snapchatting. And I, I, so uh, all these new words, blogging, texting. I mean, I mean imagine, you know, that tw 30 years ago, you're in, you're, you're in a, you, you know, let's say you're in a bar and you're meeting with some friends and you tell them, oh, I'm tweeting. I mean, they'll think, you know, what's wrong with you? But, but today you text, tweet, Snapchat, blog, and all of these new things. The millennial generation is, you know, uh, I'm not from that generation. The millennial generation is completely comfortable doing things online. And here we are in classrooms fighting, fighting everything. You know, you know, shut the laptop, you know, I'm going to cut the wireless off. But you know, instead of fighting it, let's, let's embrace it and see if we can and get, you know, uh, get them to learn with these new modalities and do better. So here's an example. So uh, when we taught the first course on uh, edX on circuits, uh, this wasn't planned at all in Mongolia in a small school called the Sant High School. Um, and, we, and we found this from a blog that they wrote, completely, you know, uh, it was there, uh, completely done by them. What the, the teacher did in the classroom was uh, they blended the classroom. They had the students watch videos and do the interactive labs and so on in their homes, and they would come to class and do uh, problem solving together. They also bought some little kits and do, uh, do, did experiments together, all in Mongolia, completely unbeknownst to us. And it turned out that, uh, uh, some of you may have read about this in the New York Times uh, uh, last week, I think, uh, article by Laura Papano. So uh, in this little experiment in Mongolia, uh, you know, uh, out popped a, a genius, uh, uh, this kid called Batushig, who was 15 years old. He got a perfect score on his insanely hard uh, MIT class and, uh, as a 15-year-old. And uh, he applied to MIT, and he got in, and he, starts, uh, he started as a freshman uh, at MIT three or four weeks ago. And of course, it wasn't just his score in this course, of course. I mean, he did a bunch of other cool things. From, the, from what he learned in the course, um, you know, we talked about uh, the people who built uh, this little uh, device for cats. He built a little uh, 
early warning system in his garage to warn cars coming out that there was a pedestrian walking uh, down the street. So he, he used what he learned in the course and did that. So he was inventive in other things, and so he got, uh, got admitted. But the point is that this was a blended class, and so the same kind of technologies we use to increase access can also help improve learning within the classroom. In fact, uh, we did a study. So we worked uh, with San Jose State University in California, and uh, they blended the classroom last fall. They had 240 students. They broke it up into three groups, 80, 80, 80. And two of the 80 groups did the regular classroom, and one of the 80 uh, groups did a blended class. They took this edX circuits course, and uh, they had their students, uh, before they come to class, watch videos, do the interactive labs, uh, and uh, you know, did the interactive problem sets. They would come to class, and they would work in uh, small groups. They would ask questions of the professor, work in groups of two or three, solve some problems. And uh, this group did that. Now, traditionally, and again, again I'm, I'm not indicating this as any proof or in a, a, a serious science or anything like that. This is completely anecdotal. This is one data point. Okay? But, but just to show you what, what is possible. So here they found that traditionally for that same course, the, the retake rate or the failure rate was about 41, 40 to 41 percent. <coughs> Similarly, in the two other sections for the same final exam, the retake rate was the same 40 to 41 percent. <coughs> Excuse me. But in the blended model class, they found that the retake rate fell to 9%. They repeated the experiment this spring. They haven't published the results yet because the first set of results that they published <coughs> got such extraordinary press that, uh, that now they want to be just 10 times more careful before they uh, say anything. And so they're still uh, noodling on the results because uh, they found that the results are actually substantially better. And so uh, they've shared the results with me, but, but you know, they don't want to publish them yet, so they, they want to be very careful. They've been <coughs> convinced enough that they want to license a number of courses <coughs> and uh, across the entire California State University system. And so, uh, so edX class are now uh, taught in a blended model uh, in a licensed mode, <coughs> excuse me, across the entire, uh, several universities of the California State system in a blended class. And San Jose State has also launched a training center called Siebel, Center for Education and Advanced Technology Learning or something like that, where they train teachers in the blended model. And, uh, and I believe uh, some of the researchers uh, from Harvard uh, are planning to be working with some of the researchers in uh, California to study the blended model in the California state system to see if we can you know, do, do a much more scientific study and understand whether you know, to what extent is this a good idea or not. So we're really excited about that, uh, that kind of work. So these blended model classes are happening in a number of places. And uh, so uh, just some examples. Uh, about, right now, uh, this is about a few months old. In edX, uh, a few months is like normal 10 years. So this is way dated. Uh, we have about five times as many now. But a number of blended classes all over the world. Uh, the National University of Mongolia is licensing a couple of courses uh, in Tsinghua University in China. Uh, all the way to, uh, to uh, uh, in, in El Salvador and so on. And, and herein is also an interesting business model for edX. Many of you heard about uh, how does edX sustain itself? So we want to be self-sustaining. And so our approach is to, uh, uh, one is to, uh, as we uh, offer free courses, students take the free courses, but we charge for ID verified certificates. Think of it as a freemium model. And so we've launched three courses this fall, and we charge for certificates. And being a mission-oriented nonprofit, we actually tell the students, look, you know, there's a $50 or $100 fee for a certificate. You can take the audit for free. I know, oh, by the way, you can donate extra. <laughs> and people are actually donating more than the minimum fee. You want to guess? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I forget uh, you know, uh, what this pilot has produced so far. But uh, when I last looked, uh, the amount of money that was coming in was about 10% more than the minimum the student could have paid. So people are actually paying more than we've asked them to in, in many, uh, many cases. This is the second business model, where as courses are created, one could imagine these courses, online courses, you can think of them as a new age textbook. So today I'm very comfortable using a textbook from a colleague. So why not use uh, videos and other forms of content? You know, uh, the, 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 the printed page has been replaced by the multimedia experience on your laptop or whatever else. You know? 
YouTube videos and the multimedia experience. So, that, so new textbooks are going to look like this multimedia experience. So that's a new age course. So why not, why not package it up as a new age textbook, if you will, and uh, uh, professors, if they want to, instructors, if they want to, can adopt that in their courses. And they can decide how much or how little of that book to use and blend the classroom and spend their time in discussion with students or helping students learn or whatever they want to do. It just opens up a new modality, it opens up more choice for the instructor. In fact, uh, we taught a couple of blended course working with uh, two community colleges locally, Mass Bay Community College and Bunker Hill Community College. And uh, you know, I'd love to connect you with the professor, Professor LaRue at uh, Bunker Hill Community College. And there they took a, uh, a uh, computer science course from MIT and taught it at Bunker, at Bunker Hill. Great experience, uh, and uh, you talk to the professor, the professor said, if not for this course, there's no way we would have taught our students a course, introductory course on Python programming and, and computational thinking. There's no way we would have done that. But they said they were very comfortable taking this new age textbook and offering that to their students and supplanting the learning uh, and, and augmenting the learning with uh, working with the students and mentoring them and, and things of that sort. So I think this will open up a lot more uh, newer ways of thinking about uh, how we can offer courses and how they can be used. Now next, let me take a few minutes to talk about why do we think that, uh, that these online models can improve learning? Okay, what, are, what are some proof points? Now here, let me, let me you know, uh, be the first one to admit that uh, I'll show you a number of references to papers and so on that the education community has known about this all along. So when I told you, you're gonna look at this and say, yeah, we knew that, we knew that. You'll be doing this about five times, okay? So, but the meta point I want to make is that, yes, we've known that, these papers have been published. The difference now is that two things. One is that we're using technology to make possible what educators have known all along, okay? Make possible some of these ideas in scale. And second is that some of these, uh, some of the buzz and, and discussions around online learning have made education really exciting. So that uh, if you're a graduate student here or undergraduate student here in education, this is the start, of the start of the golden age for education. Honestly, this is as big as it gets. Never have I seen a time in my, you know, I'm 54, in my life I haven't seen a time uh, or, or, you know, where education has been this exciting, where you know, people talk about education. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Sanjay Sarma, who's, who heads up uh, the teaching and learning effort at MIT, had an edX sticker on his laptop and was at Heathrow Airport. And he was sitting there with the laptop open and he was working. Four people come by and say, hey, I'm taking courses at edX too. So, uh, so I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting. And so this is a great time to be in education, great time to make an impact. And, I, and I'll give, give you an example. Uh, any of you here instruction designers, learning designers? Boy, you are hot. If you, you know, two years ago, if you asked somebody, you know, uh, do I need to have a, you know, work with learning designers in my course? As professors, we had no it alls. Yeah, if I knew it all, hey, I know how to teach. But now, the learning designers become uh, one of the hottest, uh, you know, uh, career paths as people want to look at online learning and say, oh my God, you know, I can improve how I teach and learn and apply some of the new technologies. And so that is going to be a really, really key, uh, you know, key career path for people. So let me give you five proof points as to how online learning can improve the quality of education. So this is a, uh, uh, a little vignette from uh, the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence course uh, taught by uh, Peter Abiel and, uh, and uh, John Klein. So here, uh, you notice that one of the first things we did was we said, we said how do we change the user interface to, uh, to reflect the kind of pedagogies we want to uh, encourage? So in a classroom, you know, we all have sat in classrooms. It's just like this talk. You know, you have someone speaking from here and you listen for a fall asleep, uh, you know, for 15 minutes or, or some amount of time. So same thing in a classroom. You sit down there and you listen for 15 minutes. And if you were like me, around the fifth minute mark, I would stop following the professor. And everybody around me seemed to be either asleep or fully understanding the professor, but I was among the ones who uh, did not follow. And then I would be rapidly scrambling, taking notes, hoping that I'll go and follow later on or ask somebody or figure things out later. And so, uh, so here what we do instead is that we replace uh, our long lectures with what we call learning sequences. So a learning sequence is a sequence of short videos. Think of them as short transfers of content with interactive engagement. So uh, a learning sequence contains uh, you know, sequences of videos, five, seven, eight minute long videos. 
interleaved with interaction, interactive exercises, labs, discussions, and things like that. So that's a learning sequence. So here's an example how at edX, we're trying to improve the platform and, and, and technology in a way to incorporate learning and pedagogies as part of the platform user interface. Okay, so for example here, so this is a, a user interface element that we created that reflects a learning sequence. It's linear, so it's a sequence. Now, you, now we can go, go back and argue whether a, a learning sequence is a good idea or a bad idea. The meta point here is that we believe something is a good idea from a pedagogical standpoint, so we can go implement that in the platform, and we did. So here you notice there are two videos. There's an interactive exercise, video, 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 interactive exercise, and so on. So user can kind of go through that and, uh, and, uh, and, and learn in a different manner than uh, they're used to today. So this learning sequence really benefits from something that uh, you all have known for a long time, okay? Uh, it's called active learning. So here's, here's uh, th this is the best paper I've read. You know, uh, you know uh, I read this about a year ago, the paper by Craig and Lockhart. How many people here have read the Craig and Lockhart paper? So this paper uh, in, from 72 talks about how you can improve student learning outcomes by rather than just talking to the student passively, have the student interact with the content and process the information while they're doing that. And, uh, this mode of active learning can, can improve student outcomes. So, so we discovered that what we were doing was really, you know, the education researchers have known that this was a good idea, so, uh, so what's new? So what's new was really the fact that we're taking those, uh, those learnings in education and applying them to user interfaces in a way that, so, so we, we, have a, we have an authoring tool called edX Studio, where professors can author courses. Think of edX Studio as garage band for courses. Okay, anybody can create a course. And so and as part of the studio, we have built into it these elements so that professors, in some sense, are steered into this mode of teaching. Now, we can go and argue whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but the point is that using computation, we can steer professors and others in the direction of teaching in a way that might be helpful. And my hope is that over time, we will learn more and more from places like uh, uh, the School of Education here and the research here or other places around the world. And Evolve the, continually evolve the platform over time to reflect best practices. So the next, uh, next proof point is uh, self-paced learning. So in a lecture hall, you know, professor goes on and on, and if it was me, as I said, after the fifth minute mark, I lose the professor. I just wish I could have paused the professor and, and be able to ask a question of somebody that says, what on earth did he just say? Just repeat that sentence for me. You know, I mean, all of you, you, know, you, you have this brain pause, you know, you can look out the window and then, for like seven seconds, and you look back, and you could have, you just, you just blew it. Okay, seven seconds is all it takes, and, and th this happens to me a lot. And so, uh, so what you can do here is, uh, so here's a little uh, video demo. So this is an example of a con con what I call a con style video, a tablet captured, uh, ta a tablet captured video. And so, uh, so here, uh, what students can do is part of a user interface. They can pause the video, they can rewind the video. Okay, heck. You can even mute the professor. <laughs> now, how cool is that? In fact, when we taught this as a blended class at MIT, a majority of the students told us that they watched the videos at 1.5 times the speed, muting the professor and reading the transcript. Who would have thought? And we also have a cool transcript in the sense that you can click on any word in the transcript, and this is unique to edX. Uh, our, our team invented this. You can click on any word in the transcript and the video will jump to exactly that point. How many, how many, how many of you have uh, watched YouTube? How many of you have tried to rewind YouTube just by just this little amount? <laughs> how hard is that? Ah, dang, it's way too far. So you go back and forth and back and forth, ah, forget it. So here, so that's very hard to do, but for, for a student, I want to go back exactly one sentence. Okay, you can't do that. It's very frustrating. So this is one of the coolest features, and where you can, student can click on any word, and the video will jump back exactly to that word. It's really cool. And the edX platform has that, and it's, it's a really cool, uh, cool feature. Oh, but, uh, things we also do is, uh, right when you watch videos and so on, rather than fighting the millennial generation, heck, embrace them. If you don't, we will lose, okay? <laughs> don't even try. Okay, so what we do is that, we embed the discussion forum right there. Show discussion. So right by the video, there's a disc mini discussion forum where they can go in and discuss. They can post things. 
man, this professor, you know, uh, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Or they can say, hey, I, I, I didn't follow uh, what was just said. Or, and so while you're watching, you, know, you can be texting and whatever else, you know, and having a discussion with others uh, uh, who are also watching at the same place. It's a contextual discussion. You don't have to go to a big forum. It's a completely contextual discussion. So you can say, what was that? That's it. And someone can answer you, because it's in the context of the video. So all these little things. Uh, the first version of a platform built a year ago did not have that. And, uh, and this was a, a discussion forum from Berkeley. And the reason we went, we did not go with a third party uh, discussion forum. A lot of people have said, go use Piazza, or go use something else, a third party forum. But there are these little things that we are able to do because it's our platform, uh, which others won't let us do, is one, we get the data, which is big. It's very important for you. Uh, where's Andrew Ho? Oh, there you go. So the so people like Andrew Ho need the data. So if you have a third party uh, platform, we won't get the data. So if research is an objective, we won't get it. So by building our own discussion forum, it will not be the best and the snazziest and have all the great features, but we can do things like this. We can embed it right where we want it and do cool things that are good for learning, but may not be the best and snazziest in terms of what industry can offer. So for, for those of you who are professors here, if you come and beat up on edX, I want this feature, remember, we, we, we do certain things that, by doing things ourselves, it allows us to do a few things and customize things that you can't do with a commercial, uh, with a commercial uh, you know, system. So uh, self-paced learning is also good. Now, what's new here? You know, uh, uh, this paper by Mayer showed that uh, students who were able to go to the next topic by hitting a continue button, you know, fared better than students who couldn't. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, when I looked at it, it was obvious to me. If in my classroom I could just pause the professor. Here, every student can pause the professor. In fact, students are telling us with the Khan style videos, they felt as the professor was sitting next to them with a personalized tutorial. The next thing is instant feedback. So uh, you know, we all have submitted homeworks. And uh, you know, uh, sometimes they come back two weeks later, sometimes never. And it takes wh a while to get any feedback. So here with the online learning, uh, remember our platform's a year old, but we can already do a large number of different kinds of assessments and exercises. Here I'll show you a quick little video of a chemical equation system. You can enter, ask questions about chemical equations, enter answers, and the computer will automatically check it. Just imagine. To me, uh, the number one unhappiness about my job as a professor was having to, was the grading. We would have, uh, you know, we, we would spend a whole day grading a midterm of 150 students, and I would get pizzas and so on, and uh, every professor would make excuses to walk, oh, I've got, I go, I, I, I got to take a phone call, and, you know, grading is a pain. And so, and, and we also, to make grading easier, we've already begun structuring questions in ways that make it easier to grade. So here, if the computer can help us do that, why not? So uh, a quick little demo of a chemical equation uh, system. So a student enters, like, there's a question. Um, this was from Michael Seamer's chemistry course. Oh, they got it wrong, whoops. Oh, uh, 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 and here they can uh, look at, they got it wrong, they can think about it again, and uh, they can keep trying till they get it right. So not only instant feedback, but there's an element of gamification where they can keep trying till they get something right, and they can keep learning. Now, uh, the other interesting element here is that this is not quite mastery learning. And so, you know, uh, education folks, correct me if I'm wrong here, but in mastery learning, from what I understand, you know, you learn a concept, you know, uh, fairly reasonably before you go to the next topic. So here, this now begins to get, uh, begin to look somewhat like mastery learning, where you can understand a topic, understand a point, get it right, and then you move on to something else because you get instant feedback. It's very hard to do it in other contexts because you send in the homework, it may take you a while to get that back. The whole gamified ex experience here with the green check mark, the green check mark here has become somewhat of a cult symbol at edX. So students are telling us that they go to bed at night dreaming of this green check mark. <laughs> in fact, uh, we had a student who took uh, uh, the circuits course in spring, and then he went on to take the Berkeley software as a service course in the fall. And uh, here is what the student had to say about the green check mark on, excuse me, on the discussion forum when he first took the course. <laughs> when the, when's the last time you heard of students you know, looking forward to homework? So, so, so I think we can bring the fun back into some of these things. And, in, and instant feedback is also, uh, it's a bit controversial, but it's been known to improve outcomes as well. The next thing, how do you teach creativity? How do you teach design? And so we have a virtual, uh, a game-like laboratory where people can construct things. So we give people a blank sheet of paper, so to speak, a bunch of components. And uh, we have these labs in uh, a few courses. These are not, not easy to build. 
So we have a few, and we're increasing the repertoire. So here I'll show you an example of a circuits lab and give you a little demo where students can take these components, and much like playing a video game, they can build things and try out things like in, a, in a virtual lab setting. Uh, it can be a lot of fun. So here's a little video example to show a student constructing something like with Legos completely online. But every student can do it and try the lab uh, again and again, and we're able to grade that, uh, grade that as well. This really brings the fun into the picture. We can also do, uh, we also bring music into some of our labs. Now again, remember, this is not, uh, with studio, some of these things are possible, but uh, again, uh, over time, we'll be able to make all of these things easy to do. So we can also bring music into, into learning. So here, for example, uh, we want students to hear what it sounds like for a circuit to process music. Okay, and so we, uh, we picked a bunch of uh, types of music. Uh, if you had enough time, we'd allow students to upload any music they want. So I'll give you a quick little demo of a lab involving music. Uh, and again, all this was in the first course uh, on edX. So students pick some music source. Oh, they pick reggae music. So now the student goes and changes the circuit a little bit, changes the design, and plays it again. So they change the circuit. And it's uh, become a low-pass filter, so it's like the bass control in your uh, amplifier. So now we can do these sorts of things online, which you could not do before. You had to walk to a lab somewhere, and, and you know, a lot of places don't even have labs. And here, for even the littlest thing, you can throw in a lab and uh, engage students with things like that. So, uh, so this can be a lot of fun. And this reminds me of the quote from Benjamin Franklin. When students are engaged, when people are learning and really connected, uh, they can really learn, uh, uh, really learn better. Finally, the discussion forum, this is a big deal. And this brings in peer learning, where students ask each other questions and, and take help from each other and uh, learn from each other. When, again, from our first course, when we had 150,000 students, we were saying to ourselves, how on earth are we going to answer all of these questions? But it turns out that uh, very quickly we realized that students were answering each other's questions. And uh, by doing so, we just had to go and answer the you know, questions that were not answered or if there was a policy issue and so on. By and large, students were learning by teaching. And the discussion forum became an extremely, extremely powerful tool in this uh, teaching arsenal. And that, and fundamentally, this is one of the key components that allows us to scale to very large numbers of, uh, of students. So uh, next, let me uh, spend the last couple of minutes uh, uh, before we open up to, uh, to questions uh, to talk about some of the uh, big data and some of the kind of learnings that, uh, uh, that are coming out. Just to give you a sense of what is possible. And again, remember, all of this is, you know, we are one year into it. There's a long way to go. Just remember, uh, cell phones in 1988, big pedestal thing. And the really cool phone right now, it took, uh, uh, took us uh, how many? Uh, 25 years to get there. OK, so uh, this is version one. Cell phones are version eight. So wait till you see version eight. OK, and, uh, and it will happen in 10 years. OK, so uh, this is just one year. So give me some examples of uh, some studies. I showed you the data from, uh, and from uh, Andrew Ho and uh, Lori Breslau and others on the homework uh, study they did. Um, we also have a, we have a page on edX called uh, Research and Pedagogy, and we, publish, and we post papers there. And uh, the paper by, uh, by Ho and uh, Breslau is on there. In fact, when we posted the paper on the edX website, it had so many downloads, education paper no less, had so many downloads that the publisher of the journal called us and said, that in its first week, in one week, the paper had more downloads than some foundational papers in magazines like Nature and Science in their entire lifetimes. A paper on education. Now, how cool is that? So here's an interesting study. So we said, uh, I'd always wondered, uh, in, in, in our normal classes, uh, do students, uh, and, uh, or on online, we have videos and exercises, do students prefer to watch a video and then go do an exercise like we have in a normal class? You teach and then you give a homework? Or do students prefer to attempt a homework first and then get the knowledge as they need it to solve the homework? It's a factor of life, folks. The millennial generation, it's all about why should I do it? <laughs> why, you know, what, why, you know, uh, it, 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 tough, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, well, that's how life is. So they need, they need to be motivated. And so nothing like giving them a homework or a lab, and then they go and get the knowledge, or a project, and then they go and get the knowledge as they need it, as opposed to saying, take your vitamins, it's good for you, okay, and then hope it helps in the future. They don't, they don't do that. Okay, so here, so we said, okay, let's study it. 
So, uh, so what we did was, uh, so in this, uh, uh, this was in uh, the fall version of uh, the circuits course. Here's the week of the course. And this says that the percent of students that first visited a video or an exercise or a homework. So blue is the percent of students that visited a video first. And the uh, rust is the percent of students that visited a homework first. So as you might imagine when the course began, you know, 75% uh, of the students very dutifully began to watch a video first because that's how we structured the course. You watch a video, then you do an exercise. So 75% went to a video first. But look at how, as the course wore on, okay? About, uh, towards the end, only about 45% of the, more than 55% of the students were actually doing a homework first and then coming, coming to a video after they watched the homework. So then in our classrooms, if, if that's the predilection of students, at least for this kind of course. Again, this doesn't generalize, and so assume I have all the caveats in place, okay? Assume all, a whole bunch of caveats. But at least for this course, why is it that in, 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 in campus, we drag students to a lecture and then give homework after? Maybe what we do is we give them a homework and put up videos and say, look, get the information, but you know, here, so go solve the homework. That may be a better way, to, uh, better way to learn. Another very interesting piece of data. So how long should videos be? And uh, this is a very interesting study done by Philip Guo, who's now a visiting uh, a professor at MIT, and he spent the summer at edX. He just said, hey, I just want to come and hack at edX and do some fun stuff with your data. He said, oh, come on over. Come and do some fun stuff. So he did some really fun stuff. So, uh, so the, the question is, how long should a video be? Okay, but what, what engages students? And so this was across, uh, uh, this study was done across uh, courses in math science uh, and computer science and so on, across MIT, Harvard, Berkeley courses. 862 videos in all, with five million, over five million watching sessions. Talk about big data. Okay, and so, uh, so what he did was, on the x-axis is the videos grouped by length. Okay, so three minute, up to three minute videos, three to six minutes, six to nine minutes, da da da, and all the way 15 to 40 minutes, which is, uh, you know, could be a full one hour, one hour video, like a, like a you videotape, a lecture. So you, let's see what the students are telling us. So on the y-axis, is the amount of time that a student spent watching that video. Okay, so video length versus how long students watch the video. So notice that if the video is less than three minutes, ah, they watch it. It, it, oops, it starts linearly. It starts linearly. So as the videos get longer and longer, one, two, three, four minutes, they'll watch the whole video. It goes on up to about six, seven, eight minutes. If it's a six, seven, six, seven, eight minute video, they'll watch it. But once the video gets longer than six, seven, eight minutes, my intuition was that this would tap off, it would saturate, okay? But they would watch more of a one hour video. But it turns out that the longer the video beyond that, they watch less. <laughs> this means that if a video is an hour long video, they're watching it for two minutes and giving up. <laughs> so you ever wondered why students are not showing up to class anymore? <laughs> they're talking with their feet here. So uh, this says that you know, you're, they really care to get the information in chunks of about six, seven minutes. Again, we can do a lot more studies here. So this says that why con, con videos are so popular, okay, and uh, which, which are about five, seven, ten minutes long, and uh, give the information in short, uh, short chunks. So what I'd like to do is pause, uh, pause there, and uh, and open up to questions, and I'd really, really encourage all of us to think about the future. And I like to say, you know, if uh, if uh, you know, lectures, you know, great lectures with theater and so on, but but future might well be in engaging students in gaming technologies and. And, and creating new ways to learn and, and really experiment. And, and this is, I really believe this is the golden age for education. Love to open up for questions. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I don't know if this is on. I'm curious, what sort of um, ways do you adapt the assignments for things that actually don't have things, uh, answers that fit into a nice little box with a green check mark? I mean, any sort of So how do you, so, so what, do you, what do you do about announcements, uh, I'm sorry, assignments, but things don't fit into a nice little box? And uh, so first of all, we support a large number of different uh, answer types, uh, uh, you know, various kinds of equations and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. I didn't show you results, but we're also experimenting with uh, uh, technology to assess open responses. So let's say, for example, a descriptive answer, or if I have to write an essay. So we've, uh, we're experimenting with three technologies. One is called self-assessment, where students grade themselves. The second one is called peer assessment, 
where students grade each other's work. So, uh, so if you go to uh, uh, edX right now, I believe the globalization course from UT Austin is using peer, uh, peer grading to assess uh, open response uh, questions. A third one we call AI assessment, where we use machine learning technology to grade essays. It's very controversial, I promise you. And, uh, and so uh, it's, it's an experimental form, and uh, we're looking to work with researchers to uh, help us tune it, understand it. There, what we do is uh, you train the computer with the first 100 essays graded by a professor against a rubric. And then, once that trains the machine, the machine then grades essays 101 onwards. And so, uh, so uh, we have data from uh, about 6,000 essays from a Hewlett Foundation data set. But one of the real challenges here is to, to assess these things. How do you really get hard data? How do you get professors to grade 1,000 essays so you can compare that to uh, you know, how the machine does? And so we have uh, done studies uh, uh, against uh, the Hewlett Foundation data set, uh, which has about 6,000 essays graded across uh, uh, different essay types. And it looks, looks very promising. So we're experimenting, experimenting a number of approaches to grade non-box-like you know, -like answers as well. Yes. Uh, how has the edX consortium formed so far, and how a particular university interested in becoming a member can actually start trying to do so, particularly if uh, that university can teach or usually teach in a different language? Let me add to the second part of the question, first language. Um, so right now, the number of courses on edX already in different languages. So uh, Tsinghua from China and Peking University from China have launched their uh, courses. Uh, in fact, one of them in circuits, using the same textbook that we use for the course that I taught in the spring. Uh, and it's in, all in Chinese. And it's on the edX. You can go and take, take it completely in Chinese on the edX platform. So Louin uh, is also a member that they're creating courses in French. And so uh, uh, language is no bar. So we have courses in multiple languages. Tsinghua is also localized. We are localizing the platform to multiple languages. And so if you want to help localize it using crowdsourcing, I, I encourage you to go to Transifex. Transifex is a crowdsourced approach to uh, localized platforms. It's being done there, uh, Chinese, Hindi, uh, English. Maybe, maybe British English, I'm just kidding. So, uh, so, so, so that's something we're, we're doing as well. To second question about the consortium, so, uh, so we have about 30 university partners on our consortium right now. And, uh, and one of the unfortunate parts is that you also want to democratize not just education in the platform, you also want to democratize authoring of courses. And we hadn't been able to do that in the past. We want to do that in the future. And, uh, and there we partnered with Google. And Google came on board as a partner. And they are working with us uh, to uh, help uh, launch either a separate site or somehow expand the current site with a second tab or something like that. But we want to open it up to a much, much larger number of institutions. We haven't quite figured that out so that uh, any institution should be able to come and create courses. Now, we have open source the platform. So a number of institutions have already stood up the platform. In fact, over the next uh, a day or two, there will be some uh, pretty big announcements where consortia are forming that use the edX open source platform and the consortia are standing up the platform and hosting hundreds of universities on the platform that they are standing up. But that is not easy to do, it takes some amount of resources. So edX is looking to see uh, how it can enable that as well. Yes. So my question is um, how the word spreads, how people knew, how your 155,000 students knew that this was available for them and how you plan to expand it out to your billion plus, you know, including all the people who don't sign up? So the, again, the two parts of the question, how do you expand to a billion? And the first part is, how do, how do people find out? And then how people find out today, absolutely no idea. <laughs> so uh, the, the whole social networking thing is a, is a total mystery. All we did, I promise you, was just put up a website and said, hey, here's the course. OK, take it. And, and we had 10,000 people sign up uh, you know, in, the, uh, in, the, in the first uh, you know, few hours. Uh, and I think the way it works is that it's this whole social network thing. One person finds out and sends an email to their friends, puts it on a Facebook site. Now, we didn't even have a Facebook page at that time. It was on a Facebook site, and people like it, and, and then they text it, and tweet it, and Snapchat it, and you know, all of these things. And before you know it, it spreads like wildfire. And, uh, and you know, the whole world knows about it. So that's one part. The second part is how do we you know, really expand the number of uh, learners? The single biggest challenge we have right now is number of courses. Okay, a typical university might have, I don't know, what does Harvard have, 10,000 courses? Does anybody know the number? How many courses at Harvard? 
8,000, so I was, I was pretty close. So, uh, so, uh, so there were about 8,000, 10,000 courses. And so, uh, and so uh, just a single university has 10,000 courses, and we have a puny 70. And learners are coming to a platform and saying, look, I want to learn about Calculus 1. We don't have a Calculus 1 course. You have this advanced course in circuits, but you don't have a basic math course. We just need thousands of courses. How do we get to thousands of courses? That's what it will take. Once we have thousands of courses, once we can cater to uh, a diverse number of subjects, including a lot of prerequisites, and, and then go on to high school as well, go to you know, pre-calculus, go to algebra. Uh, we are working with uh, Andover High, had 13 of the students take edX courses, including uh, the HEROES course from Professor Naj at Harvard, and they gave, AP credit, they gave uh, school credit for those courses. Um, one or two of our university partners are creating high school courses uh, uh, and so on. So, so this will move into high schools as well. I think once you have a really large, diverse number of courses, the, the, the number of people that access it will be more or less proportional to how many courses you have. Yes? Hi there. I'm curious um, if you consider Udacity competition, fellow pioneer, other? So, uh, so the first one, what's interesting is that uh, if you look at you, you know, the, 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 the press terms, the big three, uh, Udacity, Coursera, and edX, and what was funny was, uh, uh, you know, Sebastian Thrun, uh, Daphne Call, and I were all really good friends. And so we've known each other for, uh, for uh, donkey's years. And, uh, and so it's really fun when you get together and chat and say, this whole thing is so insane and crazy. Um, you know, I think uh, the way we are doing things is very different. Uh, I think uh, edX is focused uh, a lot. We're a nonprofit, of course. We've open sourced our platform. Um, I think uh, uh, we also uh, focus a lot more on, uh, I, shouldn't say, I should just say we focus on the quality of courses. And, uh, and I encourage you to go take courses on uh, you know, edX and Coursera and so on and see for yourself you know, what the differences are. But fundamentally, I, I see this as a good thing. If there's only one person doing it, I think it would not have been so exciting. The fact that there are multiple players, multiple people trying different things with different business models, different for-profit, non-profit, I think it's all a really good thing for education. So that, you know, we, I, I like to call it you know, the DNA diversity. So that we cannot let education fail. Okay, we have to take it forward. And so I'm glad that there's DNA, DNA diversity, multiple approaches being tried. So even if one fails, something is you know, hopefully likely to succeed. And by having many players in the mix, I think creates more of a movement rather than a lone, a lone voice that may not be heard. So I think it's a good thing. Now, you know, it, it's, it's competitive at, at some level. But really, I think it's a really good thing that uh, a number of players are working in the same field, trying to, uh, with a very similar mission. Hi, I'm Nathan Cleckley, and I'm a big time online learning enthusiast. Um, with Salman Khan's Khan Academy and uh, great programs like um, One Laptop Per Child going out, um, what they seem to be working on is what David Diamandis in his books, um, Substance, um, uh, is, is calling the rising billion, which is um, the large market that uh, these companies seem to be going for. And it's a great demographic, the world, <laughs> to be educating. But I'm really curious about uh, K through 12 learning and if anyone's approached you on that and uh, if you're ramping up for that at all or, yeah. Yeah, so in, in, in K through 12, you know, I, I personally am very passionate about K through 12. And, uh, but you know, as with any startup, you've got to focus and you've got to start somewhere. And so we started up with you know, where uh, we, we knew the most, uh, at least we thought we did, uh, in higher ed. But over time, we really plan to expand to uh, you know, continuing education. It's already in continuing education. And uh, we have students as young as 10 years old taking our courses. So 5% of our learners are below the age of 18. But that said, we want to move into high school as well. Over time, uh, many high schools are already using our courses and giving credit. Uh, we are talking to a number of high schools that, uh, and, and other organizations that want to create high school programs on the edX platform, and they're creating them as we speak. Now, uh, w once we can figure out a way to expand the edX platform, so we announce this thing with Google called MOOC.org, there might be ways in which we can allow people to come in and create courses in a much broader, diverse, uh, uh, diverse field. And so, uh, you know, clearly, uh, we have to, it doesn't make sense to just offer courses at one level. People are going to say, what about uh, the funnel coming in? You know, it's, uh, if, if uh, you know, students who've uh, had access to high school education come in, they can take higher ed education. Uh, if you just improve higher ed, it ain't, going to help with, uh, it ain't going to help you if you don't have people coming in. So you have to do the whole thing, oh, but over time. Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, what can I do to bring your, your program, your platform, to a small segment of my home country? 
and hopefully, of course, from there grow, when we don't have the technology available to the ones that I want, expose, want to expose to this. So we don't have any computers at all in my little small town. So what can I do <laughs> to help that? So uh, the example yeah. I gave you from the, uh, you know, uh, the Democratic Republic of uh, uh, the Congo was uh, the, the internet bandwidth and connectivity, uh, you know, at least cellular phone bandwidth is, 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 is spreading through the world. And I think uh, that will keep increasing. And we need to uh, encourage uh, countries to invest in that infrastructure. Um, in terms of uh, devices, you're right. Uh, everybody has smartphones, and right now, you can, actually, you can actually pull out, if you have a smartphone, you can pull it out and go to edX.org, pop up Safari or something else, and you can actually work on a course largely using your smartphone. Some things don't work, like uh, we don't support them, like the active labs and things like that don't quite work. But you can do equations. I I've actually tried it. Although we don't officially support it, I've tried it, and most of these things work, simply work. And so, uh, so uh, you can watch videos, you can do all of these things. Now, so, so, but we'll be supporting mobile technology much more over the next year or, or thereabouts. So that will make access better. And finally, I think uh, I would really encourage, you know, whether it's the world banks, whether it's policymakers, governments, rather than investing more and more into bricks and mortar institutions, uh, I like to say instead of bricks and mortar, you know, go with bits and bytes. You know, invest in uh, communication infrastructures. Um, India, the Indian government, for example, invested in something called the Akash. So it's a $40 tablet. And I was in Bombay uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and, uh, and I just saw that. It looks like a mini iPad. It's 40 bucks. It runs Android. And, uh, and uh, if it runs uh, Chrome, uh, you know, they'll be able to take uh, little tweaks, they'll be able to take edX courses on a $40 tablet. So I think it will take, uh, it will take governments and policies and uh, makers and others to realize that uh, there is a potential here and to steer investment in this direction as opposed to the same old, same old. Hi. So random assignment is an essential tool for research. It lets you infer causality, not just correlation. And right now, to conduct true experiments in edX, you have to hack it. You have to create multiple instances of a course with separate discussion forums, separate students enrolled in them. So given the research mission of edX, why doesn't that feature of randomization exist, and when will it be there? But, but randomization, you mean? Uh, randomly sort of assigning a, students to AB, different instructional sort of, conditions. Sort of A-B testing kinds of things, where sure. some students are randomly assigned one, st one track and some students uh, other track. Absolutely. So, uh, so first of all, we, we, we believe very strongly in that. And, uh, and when we had, a, uh, we had a, an early prototype platform for the first course, uh, we could actually program in, you know, using horrible programming, uh, you know, A-B tests. And so, in fact, uh, uh, we did a bunch of A-B tests in, in the first course, and we've actually published those results uh, as well. We can share some of the results with you. However, when we moved to Studio, which is this garage band for courses, make it easy to author courses, uh, we prioritized a number of things that just made it easy to create courses. And we're now coming to a point where making it easy enough to create courses uh, is working. The professors can very quickly create a course. You don't have to be a PhD in computer science to create a course. So we, I think we, we have almost gotten there. And so now we can begin looking at uh, other parts. When you don't even have the basics, it's hard to imagine doing these second order things. And so, uh, so we believe very strongly in A-B testing. You know, I, I personally did it in the first course, and I believe strongly in it. And uh, it will happen. It will happen uh, sometime over the next, uh, I would say, two or three quarters. And, uh, and the team is, uh, uh, team is working on it. Uh, either it'll be A-B testing or initially A, not A testing, so you can give people a default path and, uh, and then a, a, and a second path where some elements are not present. And that has to be integrated into our uh, studio tool, so it's easy for you to create those tests and then uh, fold in the results, observe the results, things like that. So it's very much on the roadmap, and, uh, and uh, absolutely. Just, I, I just keep telling everybody, please simply be patient with us. Thank because you. when people see us moving just extraordinarily fast, uh, it's very hard to move extraordinarily fast in 26 different directions. And there's huge demands on us. There's research, there's access, there's quality, there's all different you know, types of content, social. You just won't believe the list of extraordinary features we could go after, and we can't do everything. Our team, after all, is a very small, a very small team. 
and, uh, and, uh, and so uh, we just have to be a little patient. But, but research is a key part of a mission, and uh, it will happen. Thank you. Yes. How do you uh, plan to increase the completion rate in these courses? Great question. So, uh, so how do you plan to increase the completion rate in these courses? So if you looked at the, uh, the statistics I showed you earlier, um, the way to measure, and, and, and Andrew Ho can give a better speech on that than I can. Um, the researchers, if you, if you read the paper they wrote, they talked about measuring completion rates not by looking at how many people registered for the course, but by looking at active learners and how many of them finished the course. So we had 26,000 active learners, those that, those that at least tried a problem set. And then the number that passed was 7,000, so it was roughly about, oh, yeah, whatever, you know, roughly 25%. Okay, so the pass rate was 25%. Now, that is not bad. When you compare, so the, the, uh, first, of all, first of all, let me be defensive and tell you why it's not bad. Then I'll give you the answer to your question. It's not bad because we don't have an admissions criteria. Uh, you know, to, to get into Harvard, you have to be among the top five to seven percent, and then you get to Harvard. Okay, and then, you know, uh, 98 or 99 percent, or maybe, I don't know, 100 uh, percent pass, uh, pass, a very high pass rate. But remember, you've already whittled things down to five percent. But what edX is doing is we blasted open the funnel. Anybody can completely democratize it. Anybody can come in and take a Harvard course, just anybody. In fact, a number of people are taking these courses that have no intention of finishing them. Okay, they're just having fun. And they all, unfortunately, add to the denominator, making the uh, total statistic small. So, uh, so there, uh, because we democratize, democratize it completely, you know, it, it's not fair to compare the completion rates at a institution that has very strong admissions to one that has no admissions. So that's one. But to give you the answer to the question, we want to improve completion rates nonetheless, right? We're looking at a number of approaches to do that. One of them is we found that with the millennial generation, I'm of the generation which is, don't bother me. I don't like, I mean, how many of you like spam and email that come and bug you, do this, you know? We don't like spam. Okay, I don't like spam. But the millennial generation, for some reason, they like to be bugged about everything. So in fact, uh, you know, one person told us that we just don't send out enough emails. We said, what? We send out one email a month. And, uh, and, 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 and that too, you know, I, they had to, the marketing folks did it over my dead body. You know, I'm sort of dead now. So you know, once a month, it's too much spam. Let's not spam our students. Okay, but others are saying, no, you, you got to tell people all these cool things and all the courses and do, do it once a week, do it every three days. Let me take a quick poll here. If you were part of edX, how many people would like an email telling them about the courses and happenings and, and remind them about things? How many people prefer it to happen once a month? How many people would like to happen it once in two weeks? How many people like to have it weekly? Wow, weekly is the highest. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I should go and tell our marketing folks, send out a weekly email. I think the new, I think our, the new world, I think people are OK with getting, you know, getting this stuff. And so, uh, so that's one approach, which is you, you tell people, you ping them. And, and, and people react to being pinged. You know, again, I go back to my, my children. Until you tell them, you know, go make your bed, they're not going to do it. OK, so you've got to ping them. So that's, so, so maybe, so that's one approach. That, that's helping. <laughs> so the second, the, the second one is, and Walter Lewin did this for his physics course, which is a lot of students drop out because they don't have the prerequisites in the background. So what he would do is go to the discussion forums, and he would look at all the questions being asked. And if there was a difficult, people were having difficulty, he would create a special video tutorial on that difficulty and post it that same week. That helped students a lot. The third, the third idea is, uh, uh, again, this, the, 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 the paper from Harvard and MIT showed that there was a strong correlation between success and those students that worked in groups. So now, uh, so we are learning every day. So now when you go to an edX course and uh, we talk about meetups, we I'd really encourage people to form meetup groups and get together and find a buddy, buddy learning, uh, inventing these new terms, and you know, work with somebody else and work together in groups and so on and collaborate and that will improve learning outcomes. So we're trying many of these techniques. And also at the end of the day, I think uh, we will also improve things like uh, create tutoring systems. So we, we talked to a company that wants to offer tutoring services where just imagine in a discussion forum, I could ask a question and I could have a button next to it, connect me to a tutor. Just click and, 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 and use one of those, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it, Hangouts, Snapchat, whatever, text, tweet, twerp, well, you know, <laughs> any of those things, and, and get connected to a tutor um, how many people of you here have heard of Growing Stars? 
So Growing Stars is uh, it's outsourced tutoring. There's a company that has a bunch of tutors who are PhDs and doctors and so on. All they do is sit, they sit there and they do remote tutoring. And these are doctors and engineers and you know, they're great, and, and, and high school students here can work with Growing Stars as an example and they can get tutored in certain subjects at 30 bucks or 40 bucks an hour. So there are a lot of these online tutoring services, so maybe we can connect them up and, and help as well. So that's, a, again, it's a long, I could go on talking forever as to how we can improve things. Yes, go ahead. Hi there. Um, so you mentioned that research is one of the three linchpins of edX's mission, and you also shared with us a couple of the findings from the studies from uh, individual classes that have been done so far. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to edX's uh, plans or overarching roadmap for research, particularly as it concerns uh, universe, uh, uh, the, the edX uh, consortium's um, university efforts to do research and sharing, sharing findings, not just with the broader community, but within, so that you know, your UC Berkeley uh, edX course developers are sharing what they learn with the MIT course developers. So, uh, so first of all, just to be very clear, at edX, I don't expect to, 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 to develop a research team within edX. So our goal within edX is uh, we'll facilitate research, you know, make up, so right now we're making data available in a pretty raw form. We want to make data available. In fact, I think there's a conversation happening with folks at Harvard this Friday. So, you know, what is the format of the data? Is it uh, uh, certain kinds of strings, tuples, you know, JSON string? What, what's the format? So, so our focus will be making data available and, and helping you and getting feedback as to what data you want and we gather the data and make this big data and, and delude you with the, uh, data, right? That will be edX's focus. Our partners will do the research and come up with these cool things that they want to, uh, want to study. And so your question had to do with uh, uh, how will they share the information and the data? And so we formed the X Consortium, and our hope is that they will share best practices and share data. We're already seeing joint proposals to NSF and other places between Harvard, MIT, Georgetown, UT, Austin, and other places that combining and doing these things. But it's just not fast enough for my liking. And, I, I, and you know, I'd love to see much more collaboration, much more interaction, and, uh, and uh, you know, really, really make sure that uh, there's a real vibrant community that is writing proposals and doing these sort of things. And uh, so we're trying to facilitate that. But again, it's, you know, we're, we're trying to do 77 different things with a very small team. And, and really, that's the single biggest issue for us. We're trying to do too much in too little time with too few people. Thank yes. Hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk and your efforts. Uh, so I'm wondering, I took a Coursera class, and one of my big difficulties was access and uh, connectivity while I was living in a, a rural area. So. Uh, they, they made their videos downloadable, and so that was really helpful, but I missed some deadlines and didn't finish the course. Uh, but I was wondering how, how you might sort of incorporate that into your you know, efforts, if you can make some of the activities downloadable, or if that's in your plans for the future. So a couple of, uh, couple of answers to that. So first of all, uh, you know, uh, our videos are also downloadable, so people can download the videos. However, for IP reasons, some of our instructors' courses and universities uh, do not like the videos to be downloadable. So what we did there was our team implemented a really cool feature where you can access a video on YouTube, and many countries block YouTube, like China. So what our system does, will automatically switch to a second location. And we worked with certain companies in local areas, like with NetEase in China, and, and with uh, certain other hosting providers where uh, you can host the videos there and sort of switch to a local video. Now there are a lot of things we can do. We can work with the content distribution networks like Akamai and so on. All of those costs money, and that's one of the challenges. So, so money can solve many of these problems because they, they charge you a fee to do that. And so over time, we can help improve uh, these sorts of things. Uh, the second one, so, so, we, so we can make a lot of these things uh, downloadable, and so I think uh, that can really improve the, uh, the student experience for uh, you know, students wherever they are uh, uh, in the world. Yes. Good evening. Uh, I'd be curious about how you think about the revenue model and pricing not so much for yourself, but for drawing people in and encouraging completion and how you thought through that. So, uh, so, uh, so even though edX is a, is, uh, is a non-profit, uh, you know, non-profit doesn't mean that edX, uh, we had a deep hole into which you pour money every year and you never see it again. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as Jim pointed out, I'm an entrepreneur and, you know, being, 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 uh, being self-sustaining uh, is, is a very important part of our goal. So we hope to be self-sustaining you know, some, at some point in the future. And so, uh, so we're looking at a number of revenue generation schemes, and we actually are, we have a fair amount of revenue already. Looking at two broad approaches. 
a B2C, business to consumer, and a B2B, business to business. On the business to consumer, we're looking at a freemium style models where you can take the course for free, you can audit the course, you can take the course for free. Heck, we even give you a free honor code certificate. And, but then we issue, you know, we have an ID verified certificate where you take a picture, you show your ID, and we, have, we work with a company, Software Secure, right here in Newton, great company, great people, uh, where, they, where they have uh, people in India that actually look at the, the picture and the, and the ID and, they verify, and, they, and we uh, pay them a small fee. So there we charge a premium for those kinds of certificates. So that's one approach. Uh, donations is, an, is another approach. So these are all B2C approaches. If you go with tutoring, one could imagine, uh, you know, you want to get a tutor, you pay extra. Those are all freemium services. That's B2C. And we are piloting some ideas there. The second one is B2B, where you work with businesses. So uh, we announced the one that we've, we're working a number of them right now. We announced IMF, so I can talk about the International Monetary Fund. So they came to us and they said, hey, look, this looks cool. We want to train our own employees. And we also want to educate government officials and so on in various countries on things like the debt crisis and stuff like that. And we want to do it through MOOCs. Imagine a cool, what a cool concept. You know, IMF now does MOOCs that can train people in, in countries about various fiscal policies and things like that. And so there we're working with them. We will host a separate instance of the platform for them uh, where they don't have to do the hosting themselves. But edX hosts it for them. Now, they could take the open source and do it completely by themselves. But they say, hey, edX, please help us here. You know, we'll pay you. So a number of people, in fact, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of people have come to us, to uh, companies and, and organizations, governments, in fact, states, towns, um, state systems, countries, to help, help them do that. And so we are totally overwhelmed right now, just absolutely overwhelmed. We are drowning. We don't even have time to respond to uh, some of these. And so uh, if we appear rude, you know why. And so, uh, and so, uh, and so uh, they can offer MOOC courses. And so they're paying us a fair amount of money. And we can do, host the platform for them and offer courses. So that's one example of a B2B business. And so we're looking at a number of these approaches and, and piloting a few to see uh, what works. Thank you. Yes. Hi, <coughs> my name is Griff. I'm in the International Education Policy Program here. And I wanted to hear a bit more what you thought about how your, um, your vision for fostering collaboration between students and what maybe what you could call extracurricular edX life in general. Um, having taken the Origins of Global Poverty course in the spring, um, I found that, you know, the largest shortcoming when you look at you know, your half percent retention rate all the way through to the certificate wasn't the content or the assessment. It was that you know, edX is really using tools that are designed to have two to five people talk together, like you know, sc you know, Skype tutoring sessions and chats for courses that have 50,000 learners. And I, I was living in Kyrgyzstan, and it wasn't until after the class was done that I found out that five of my friends who lived a mile from me were doing the same class. So I was hoping you could just talk a bit more about ways that you envision creating more of a collaborative environment, because I think that's, you know, that's a really important part for getting retention rates up. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think those are great, uh, great ideas. And so uh, uh, you know, I, I can dream up this cool tool. Okay, now, I, you know, if my engineering team hears me, because when they see me, you know, they, they call me. Uh, they see me coming, they said, no more ideas. <laughs> so, so, uh, so they see me coming, they all hide, you know, because I always have a new idea for them. So here's an idea. Well, what edX could do is uh, so you're a student, and everybody, we know all the, so when you enter, you, you punch in your location. You say, which town are you in? And, you know, and we have all that information online. So you could simply say, you know, just imagine, click a button that says, connect me. Okay? And if you give permission to allow yourself to be connected uh, to others, we can say, okay, here are four others in your geographical neighborhood. You can send them an email. And you click and send them an email and you form a little community. So just imagine, that's a little feature, right? So, uh, so there's thousands of ideas like this that we could do. So one thing we do do is that uh, we send out an email to all the students, encouraging them to uh, form meetup groups. So on the discussion forum, many students say, hey, I'm from uh, you know, uh, uh, Ukraine or from this town, Ulan Bator. Hey, uh, do others want to form a meetup group? And, and people sign up and, and they form these little, uh, little groups. So we see some of that happening. But edX could uh, uh, do that. It'll be fun for students, and I think it'll improve learning outcomes as well. It also includes, include, uh, increase the uh, number of students taking courses because they go tell their friends. So if you have any other ideas along those lines as you've thought about it, what might have helped you, uh, you know, grab me after and tell me, Anand, this is exactly what could have helped me. I'd love to hear from you. Yes. Hi. As last, you have the last question. As you have up on the screen, uh, great lectures for theater and the future is in games. So um, if the lecture hall is uh, a thing of the past, 
than um, what would be the school of the future? What would it contain? You know, to support the blended classroom, which seems like the ideal model, at least where you're heading with this now. You know, if you were to design a bricks and mortar school, um, what kind of spaces would it great, have? Uh, great question, and, and uh, just so you know, a lot of people are thinking about this. Uh, just uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, uh, the MP in, in the UK from uh, Herefordshire uh, was, was at edX. And he was with, uh, with, the, with the president. They're creating a new university in Herefordshire in, in UK. And, uh, they, and they were wanting to just discuss exactly that. We have this, you know, we are raising money and we have this dream and vision to create a whole new university. And they're calling it uh, the new university or something like that. The Hereford, you know, the new, new university or new university of Herefordshire or something like that. And so they said, how would you create a university? And I said, whoa, well, what an opportunity. If you're creating something from the ground up, incredible opportunity to do new things. And I, li I like to think of this as saying, instead of thinking of large lecture halls, you may have one or two, I have a few for, for certain types of courses, but really think of what I call e-spaces. Think of creating spaces for students where students are working by themselves, need lots of little spaces for them to get together for coffee, for other fluids of their choice. And, and, and doing homeworks and working together in small groups. So lots of, lots of little, little fun spaces where they can get together and, and, and work together, where they can, you know, with great Wi-Fi connectivity and so on, you know, uh, work together in groups. Uh, you know, I like to talk about uh, uh, digital dormitories, where, where even dormitories be a place where not just people sleep and eat and then go off elsewhere, but really become a learning environment. And really distributing education throughout a campus, uh, you know, as a way of uh, you know, doing something like this. Uh, there are many, many examples where one could imagine, uh, you know, doing new things. Uh, yet another example is that uh, you know, as people work, up, even on a campus, to be able to have students connect with each other, uh, you know, to form small groups. You know, why do we have to go and find uh, uh, some other uh, a dorm mate or something? Uh, connect up people in a given area at a given time. Uh, instructors maybe meet students in, in spaces again. So it becomes much more uh, of, a, of a personalized learning style. And so uh, I would focus on small e-spaces as opposed to big, big halls. So the, the lecture hall should be demolished in the existing uh, I think there should be at least. I think there should be at least one. <laughs> but, I mean, how, how else can we show our grandkids that, you know, your grandfather used to go and we all sat down in neat little rows like corn stalks. <laughs> You've got to have at least one. No, no I'm just kidding. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of courses where the lecture is just exactly the right modality. So I think we just need to ha have, a, have a mix. And there's a very politically correct statement for you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Oh, no, this was. Uh...